Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. This month's program is special for us here. This is our 10th anniversary show, and it's hard to believe that 10 years has gone by uh, coming to you every month. Uh, to celebrate this special program, we're going to have some reminiscences with several of our crew members here at Astronomy for Everyone to uh, kind of go over what got us interested in the hobby. With me here in the studio for segment one is John McGill and Ken Anderson. Gentlemen, glad to have you on the program. We're glad to be here and congratulations on 10 years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I second that thought. <laughs> All right, thank you, John. Well, we're gonna begin with you. And so tell our viewers, what was it that sparked your interest in astronomy? Well, my uh, interest in astronomy was kind of a path or a road that I went down. And uh, it started in 1986 with uh, Halley's Comet. And that, I remember being out in the street with the neighbors and uh, we were naked eye viewing Halley's Comet. And that was, um, you know, such a buildup to it, and to actually see it with your own eyes, that was quite spectacular. It was an amazing sight, yes. And so then uh, the path continued um, on to um, Shoemaker-Levy 9, oh, and yes. that was a comet that actually impacted uh, Jupiter. Yes. And when that happened, uh, it was uh, Gene Shoemaker, uh, Carol Shoemaker, or Carolyn Shoemaker, and uh, David Levy, they um, predicted that this was going to happen. And so this was all in the news, and uh, people were actually able to watch this in real time as it happened. And uh, everything just kind of lined up perfectly, where um, when the fragments were hitting Jupiter, it was actually hitting it on the shadow side of Jupiter. And so it, it was quite spectacular to actually see the impacts. And uh, there was about 21 impacts um, that were uh, actually documented. And you could see them in amateur telescopes, some of them, not all of them. Those dark spots. Yeah, and they lasted for uh, quite a while. And, uh, and I, I was traveling on a business trip in Atlanta uh, while that happened, and uh, there was a an observatory down there that I went to. So through their big refractor telescope, I could actually see the impact score marks. Yeah, so, you know, these, these are a couple things. And uh, then um, uh, David Levy, who was probably one of uh, the greatest comet hunters of the 90s. Yes, in, yes. Uh, he was one of the um, guys that discovered Shoemaker Levy uh, there's a picture of him on uh, on the screen now. And uh, David Levy actually came in. Uh, well, he was uh, the the uh, guest speaker at both Astronomy at the Beach and uh, one of the Great Lake Stargazers. Yeah, and um, with him, he's a fantastic uh, speaker. Now he's not an astronomer, but he brings um, he he goes into the historical records and he finds like books or plays that talk about um, comets or things that happened in history and he tries to um, put dates on them by uh, going back in time and actually looking up uh, you know these records that go back centuries and uh, so he probably was the one influence on me to hear him speak in his enthusiasm um, of just how he put into words that he was probably uh, the biggest influence on me getting into astronomy. And then uh, the last um, comet that was a big influence was um, Hayataki. Um, now Hayataki, that was the great comet of uh, 1996. And um, that uh, also was a naked eye uh, comet, and that was uh, the closest approaching comet uh, in 200 years. 
And uh, this picture was by uh, Mr. Eclipse or Fred Espinek, who was also uh, one of our guests at Astronomy at the Beach. Yeah, just a few year. years ago, yeah. Yeah, and um, then the last comet that I want to talk about um, was Comet hale -Bopp. Oh, yeah. Now, this one comet was a thousand times brighter than uh, Halley's Comet. And uh, this also was a naked eye object that lasted uh, for quite a few months. And I remember this one going out in my backyard and uh, watching it every morning before I went to work. I would go out there and glance at it and it was just awe-inspiring. It and was. I remember going for walks and you could even see it before it got completely dark out. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, so then, uh, and then, and then uh, also with Hale Bopp, um, that was the first uh, astronomy at the beach, and we had like twelve thousand people show up. So it was the the biggest attendance we ever had, and uh, uh, so my my oldest daughter, she was like about six years back then, and uh, she made a little uh, Hale Bopp comet out of out of uh, play doh. You know, <laughs> don't have that now, but <laughs> it'd be it great to cute, have though. Kind of kind of yeah. cute when she made it. And uh, there was also a tragic side to uh, Comet hale -Bopp in um, it was the Heaven's Gate cult out of uh, San Diego. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, there was a mass suicide because uh, their prophet had uh, told them that there was an extraterrestrial vehicle or spaceship following the comet, and the only way that they could get to heaven was to... Uh, Commit suicide and have their souls get on board that yeah. spacecraft, and it's unfortunate. I, yeah, I just can't believe how some people can be talked into things. Yeah, and but, uh, it, it sounds like comets have really been a way for you to get into astronomy and your inspiration. That that is it. Um, personally, I like uh, the dynamic objects into this in the sky as opposed to uh, you know the static stars so I, I constellations look, that sort of thing <laughs> yeah so I, I look for other things and after uh, Ken gets done uh, with with that with his uh, talk on how he got into astronomy we'll get into some of the more dynamic objects that we have um, observed together all right well hopefully we'll have some time for that in this segment thank you John mm -hmm. All right, Ken, I'll ask you the same question. What, uh, what inspired you? What sparked your interest in astronomy? Well, um, my, my interest was uh, sparked by two things. Uh, um, before I got my telescope, uh, there was this book by uh, uh, Patrick Moore, um, and uh, it's called uh, Atlas of the Universe. I'll just get the title page here. Uh. I see a lot of notes. Yeah, that's on the inside the, there. so it's Atlas of the Universe, and you can see I have a lot of notes in here. And uh, when I got my first telescope, I was writing down everything that I saw, and I also put little references in the books when I when I saw it. So uh, uh, so this this got me interested in astronomy. And then uh, um, at the at when I was in Fort Wayne at the Three Rivers Festival, the Fort Wayne Astrom uh, Amateur Astronomy Club was uh, had their telescope out there, so I looked through it, and the first thing I saw up in the sky was Saturn, okay. and uh, I, I, you know, I went behind the telescope and I looked up and I said, "Is that that bright star up there?" And they go, "Yeah, that's Saturn." And I, at that point, that's when I realized, I go, "Well, if I can see it, I can find it," and it really isn't as hard as uh, uh, I that I thought it would be. So okay. it, it was uh, doable. And, uh, and then uh, I developed an interest in uh, looking at deep sky objects with my 10-inch uh, telescope and now 17-and-a-half-inch uh, telescope. So that was also, could we say, your aha moment? That was my, uh, those two were my aha moments where they got me into astronomy. And excellent, excellent. And you've been with it uh, for all these years and being in the Ford Club uh, for so many years, I know you're an excellent star hopper. Your knowledge yeah. of the night sky is Pretty extensive. Yeah, my, my, my telescopes are all manual Dobsonians, so it's all up here in my head trying to <laughs> find them with the, the maps and the star charts. You don't have to worry about bringing batteries. No, I don't bring <laughs> to batteries. guide the scope. That, that's when uh, we have our meetings and we go into the planetarium 
first thing we do is give Ken uh, the laser pointer, and he starts pointing everything out in the planetarium for us. So, yeah, he's uh, Mr. Sky. All right, well, I think we still have a couple of minutes left in this segment, so if we wanted to get to as many of those images that you were talking about, John? Yeah, um, let's go into uh, the Nova and Delphinius. And uh, if we could put that one up on the screen. Uh, there we go. That one, uh, that was a short-lived, um, that was a short-lived Nova. And uh, Ken, if you want to tell us where that was. So uh, uh, Delphinus is uh, between Pegasus and Altair, about, about, about midway in there. Okay. And uh, it, the constellation looks like a dolphin, so or a fish, so that's yeah. where it comes from. And let's go to uh, Comet Ison. And uh, Comet Ison, that uh, was in late November, early December of 2013. And uh, this one had had a lot of hype, and it never lived up to the hype. It, uh, it was good, almost uh, naked eye, before it uh, went around the sun and perihelion, but, uh, or perihelion, but um, it never made it um, together out the other side and so okay so it just broke apart and that was it and that was it the next comet of the century that wasn't yeah <laughs> yep and if we have uh I, I was just wondering could we just go to like m31 32 and 110 uh, i think we've only got about another minute or so but we can uh, get that in real quick okay all it, right let's see the they can do the magic I, I i like uh multiple objects and this one has three galaxies that you can see in the same field of view. M110 is the fuzzy one up on the right, uh, Drowman M31 is the large one, and M32 is the one on the bottom, the bright small galaxy. So you can see all three in, in the same field of view. Well, that's quite, uh, quite an image to, uh, to take a look at. I want to thank you both for being part of segment one for what sparked your interest in astronomy for our 10th anniversary show. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you have a question, as always, please send us an email. We like to see those. And coming up next, as always, is C Stephen with Term of the Month. Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for June 2019? The sun rises at 6 at the beginning of the month and at 6 at the end of the month. That's because the summer solstice is June 21st. So the sun doesn't rise and set very differently over the course of the month, and that doesn't matter where you are on the planet. Uh, the sun sets at about 9 p.m., um, give or take a few minutes, and these times are uh, Michigan, which is in a weird place in its daylight savings time zone. The moon starts new on the 3rd. The first quarter is on the 10th, full moon, that's when NASA can't uh, go back to the moon because it's full, uh, is on the 17th. And finally, the third quarter is on the 25th. Mercury is in Taurus to Cancer over the month. It sets at uh, 10 p.m. to or 10.09 p.m. to 10.27. It is better at the beginning of the month, and uh, that has to do with um, uh, uh, an elongation that happens earlier in the month. Mars is in Gemini and moves to Cancer, so they're both in Cancer at the end of the month or closer, and it sets at 11.15 to 10.28 over the month, and it's better at the beginning of the month. Mars and Mercury are in Cancer at the end of the month. Venus goes from Aries to Taurus at, and uh, rises at 5.05 to, and to 5.10 a.m. Uh, over the course of the month. It's best at the beginning of the month. It's just a little higher in the sky. Uranus is in Aries, which is where you'd think that Mars would be, but Aries. Uh, it's always in Aries, almost. Um, and it rises at 4.17 to 2.26 a.m., and it is better, a little better, at the end of the month. Um, Neptune is in Aquarius, uh, where it's always been, it seems, and it rises from 2.34 to uh, 40 minutes after midnight uh, over the course of the month. Uh, uh, it's arbitrary. I think it's a little bit better at the end of the month. 
Jupiter is in Ophiuchus and rises uh, from 9.40 p.m. to 7.28 p.m. over the course of the month. It is excellent all month because opposition for Jupiter is June 10th, so it's up almost all night. Saturn is in Sagittarius, which is not too far away, and uh, it rises from 11.40 p.m. to 9.40 p.m. over the course of the month, and uh, it's up most of the night because opposition is July, just next month, July 9th. Pluto is also in Sagittarius, it's right next to Saturn, so it has similar times for rises, 11.55 to 10 p.m., and its opposition is July 14th. July is my go-to uh, month for Pluto, and that is uh, what's up in the night sky for June 2019. Remember, we don't charge for this show, but we may tax your brain. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back to the show. This is our special 10th anniversary program, and we're talking with several of our Astronomy for Everyone crew members and finding out what sparked their interest in the hobby of astronomy. With me in segment two is Stephen, Witte, and Kevin Medden. Gentlemen, welcome to this part of the, to the show. Thank you. Thanks for, being, thanks for having me on. <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway, Stephen, we're going to start with you. What sparked your interest in astronomy? So what really happened is that the family got a telescope. It wasn't a particularly big scope. It was uh, maybe a 50 millimeter, you know, so two and a half inches, uh, four, uh, you know, not huge. It was just, exactly, just you yeah. know, uh, in diameter. Was it a TASCO? And, I mean, and, I think no, it was a Sears, a Sears scope. So it was, you know, it was maybe this long. Okay. And it had a tabletop tripod that it came on. Now, uh, a lot of really cheap scopes uh, today, the mount is terrible and the, and the scope, you know, vibrates all over the place. But this one was, you put it on a table and it, it, you point it and it would actually stay where you pointed it. Right. Uh, so right. I had no complaints about it. I don't know what the magnification was. It seemed to be okay. I didn't really think too much about it. I did have trouble finding much of anything of interest. I couldn't find any of the planets. I didn't have, I certainly didn't have today's software. Uh, but I had a few books, and they didn't they didn't give me predictions about where to where to look, so I didn't I, I didn't have a magazine or anything that had up to date information, so um, that um, that uh, was how it was. I would just sort of look at random things, and I was looking for anything that was different. But mostly, what I saw were individual stars. So um, when uh, I was maybe I don't know third grade or something like that. In the summer, I went to what would, what would be called a day camp, except that it was an astronomy camp held, of course, at night. So there was a, an hour class, and then we would go uh, look through telescopes, which were six-inch reflectors. And they had, and I remember it being something like a 19-inch um, refractory in, a, in, a, in an observatory, but I've not been able to go back to uh, records and find out what it really was. It was the Talcott Mountain uh, Observatory in Connecticut. Oh, okay, okay. It was on Talcott Mountain. It's hard. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that that got my interest up quite a bit. Uh, uh, fast forward to when I was um, 13. In 1972, there was an eclipse that went through Canada, and I lived in Connecticut. And uh, I knew it was going to be while I was at Boy Scout camp. So I brought that telescope to, uh, to camp, and I set it up in the dirt parking lot. And uh, I, I um, uh, did eyepiece projection uh, of the eclipse. Good, you didn't look the, through the, yeah. the entire yeah. time. So I was all set. I was all prepared. I had a, 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 a notebook, and I put a white piece of paper on it. And I got the image, you know, on the on the piece of paper and all of that sort of stuff. I don't remember doing any rehearsal, but I had everything all, all lined up. I knew exactly what to do, right. and I do that same sort of thing. So here we see uh, sort of how it looked. Um, so normally I don't take pictures. I don't publish pictures of children, uh, but you know you really can't tell that much. There's no personally identifiable information on that uh, sneaker, but you can see uh, the. Uh, uh, the dirt parking lot, and you can kind of make out the black uh, 
uh, notebook uh, and the, the paper on it. Um, the, um, the photo paper is, uh, that was used to print this uh, has this sort of stipple pattern. It looks a lot better in person than it does uh, on the TV. It does on the TV. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting way to get started. Kevin, what was uh, your spark? The Manned Space Program. That's the, a good one. The original Southern. Okay. Of course, I'm probably dating myself, but it was through that and through going outside and seeing Explorer floating around and you know trying to figure out you know satellite tracks and gradually as the the, the space program picked up as we went from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo, I kept understanding a little more and a little more. And I don't know if you guys remember, but way back in the 60s, there was this uh, astronomy thing that came out where you got these really small books. One would cover the planets. One would be like galaxies and stuff. And they all had these big stamps. And you'd have to glue the stamp to the proper like you know, heading. No, I don't remember that. Yeah, so that was one of the things that you know caught my eye. And, and you know, gradually it just built up through Voyager and you know, and everything else. And the older I got, the more I wanted to learn the sky. And that's what, you know, ev eventually that's what triggered it all. Any aha moment for yourself? I think probably, and I'm probably going to mispronounce the name of this comet, but it was discovered by a Japanese uh, gentleman. I believe it was called Ikea Seki. And okay. yeah, it rings a bell. It rings was bell. supposed to be like 65, 66 in that time frame. It was supposed to have this super long tail, and it actually, before Kohotek, this was the one that actually lived up to the hype. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> yeah. okay. everybody remembers Kohotek, you know, we were all anticipating it, and it flopped, and then, of course, Comet Weiss just blew it out of the water. Yeah, exactly. Uh, David Levy says that uh, comets are like cats. They both have tails, and they do what they want. That's very true. <laughs> well, young man, what about you? Me? Well, um, my uh, thing that sparked me was a map of the night sky in National Geographic back 1965-66. And I remember going out into my parents' backyard over on the, uh, the east side of Detroit and looking up into the night sky with my white light flashlight. I mean, who knew, <laughs> right? We didn't know from a red light back then, but it still worked. And just looking down at the map and looking up at the, uh, the night sky and kind of learning my way around and taking some astronomy uh, courses in college. But then it sort of faded away. My aha moment was one night I was up north with my brother and uh, his wife at a cottage. And uh, it was a moonless night. And so we were out on this little lake in a canoe, my wife and I, and I remember just looking up and there was the Milky Way. And it was, oh my God. <laughs> and so I, I got back into it after that, bought my first telescope, joined the, uh, the Ford Club, and uh, well, as they say, the rest is history. So that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Because I never saw the Milky Way until I went to Flagstaff. So of all places to see it, I saw it at the Lowell Observatory. Well, sure, okay. <laughs> well, they've got a pretty good... Uh, light pollution abatement ordinance out there in Flagstaff. Yes, they do, and the 23-inch uh, the Clark is a very nice instrument to look at the uh, Hercules cluster through. Oh, I'll bet it is. <laughs> I'll bet it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting path that all of us uh, on this show have taken to arrive at, at where we are now uh, in terms of our interest in astronomy. Um, and it's not... I hate to say the old cliche that it's not rocket science, but it isn't if, no. if, if you're dedicated enough to it. Yeah, you have the interest and the desire, uh, I think, are, are what drive it. And you can be doing it when you're 13 in a dusty parking lot or, you know, our age and even older. Uh, as long as that desire is there, um, there's no reason why we can't keep doing it. And I think part of it is... It, it's kind of honest. Hopefully we can find the younger ones who have that same interest and help nurture that. Because I look around the astronomy community, uh, the clubs and other things, and I see an awful lot of gray hair. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's important, I think, and uh, hopefully you gentlemen agree too, that uh, to get the younger ones, give them their aha moment or help kindle that spark for them.
I have to say that showing a Cub Scout like Mars in a telescope, in a decent telescope, uh, they'll, they'll be like totally amazed and say something. And that, that it feels good to, do, to have done that. Yeah, to see that look on their face and uh, yeah, it's, it's a great, great, great feeling. I want to thank all of my guests from our Astronomy for Everyone crew to, uh, for being on today. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you, our, vis our viewers for the last 10 years. Thank you very much for your support and we do appreciate it. Uh, if you would like, please go to our website, the club website. Uh, the address is down there at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next with What's Up in the Night Sky is, of course, Stephen. Thanks, Don. The term of the month is Ultima Thule. New Horizons famously went by uh, Pluto and Charon in 2015, and in January of 2019, very early, it got the left picture, which is the very first picture of this asteroid out in the Kuiper Belt, Ultima Thule. The larger section was later named Ultima, and the smaller section is named Thule. On the right there, the above picture, the two spheres, that was what we thought from this uh, left picture, what Ultima Thule must look like. But a month later, they got data from when, the, when New Horizons was behind uh, the object, and they were able to get shape data out of it. And it turns out it's like a pancake uh, uh, attached to a potato edgewise. Very strange. Term of the month, Ultima Thule.